This episode is brought to you by SwitchPod, which is a handheld minimal tripod that I co-invented with my partner, Pat Flynn, and we created it so it'd be really easy to hold your camera and film yourself or other people, and then quickly open up the legs of the tripod, set the camera down, and be on your way. So check it out at switchpod.co. And you can use the coupon code CALEB to save $5 off your purchase. That's C-A-L-E-B. Hey, welcome to episode 84 of my podcast. I'm Caleb Wojcik, and in this episode, I'm talking with Thomas Frank, who is a full-time YouTuber. He built up a brand called College Info Geek, and I've been friends with him for, I don't know, five, six, seven years now, back from when I was blogging when I worked at Fizzle. And I've seen him over the years and through, I think, three other interviews on my podcast, I've seen him grow his YouTube channel into a full-fledged business where hundreds of thousands of people watch every video that he puts out. He talks a lot about productivity and, you know, just being better as a human, you know, self-improvement, having better habits, all that kind of stuff. And so in this episode, I talked to him virtually, actually. If you're watching this one on YouTube, he's in Denver, Colorado. I'm in San Diego, California, but we both filmed ourselves on high quality cameras. Let me know what you think of that setup because I feel like a lot of the people I interview when I just start doing audio only. I could also have them film because they're creatives, they're filmmakers or YouTubers or whoever. So if you like this format, if you like watching versus just listening, definitely let me know. But we talk about how he's grown the YouTube channel. So how he took an existing blog and then just started to make videos for fun just to see if people would you know, end up on his blog and end up on his email list and he would grow that way but actually YouTube kind of took off for him and it became a whole new outlet, a whole new focus for him and his business. We talk a little bit about what it's like to actually have an agency that you're a part of. So he's a part of a a, a YouTube agency that has a lot of other YouTube channels in it that helps him get sponsors and, and opens up a lot of other doors for him. So we talk in detail about what it's like to work with a group like that and what to avoid if you're considering doing that as well. And we kind of close out talking about general tips for 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 YouTubers, for video creators that you know might be getting in their own way, like roadblocks that are stopping them, and it, advice for pushing through and just getting your videos made, and how to kind of think about: Is this video going to get views? Is it going to not get much attention? But I'm going to make it anyway. Talking through a lot a lot of those things that he thinks about now that he would, would consider himself a full-time YouTuber and educator uh, on, on the platform. So let's jump into it. So Thomas, you've been on my podcast a bunch of times. People can go into the archives to find out about like your your progression, your journey from starting a website like College Info Geek up into launching your YouTube channel, the explosion of growth. Now, what do you even call yourself? Do you call yourself like a full-time YouTuber or an educator or what, what do you use as a label for yourself? Yeah, I still say YouTuber. Um, and I've also kind of made this shift towards thinking of myself more as an artist than as an entrepreneur. And I don't, I don't know how you feel about the term entrepreneur, but I've, I've got some friends who say that, uh, you know, entrepreneurs are people who start new businesses all the time. And at, at this point, I've been running the same business for 10 years, just expanding it and adding new types of content. And really, I kind of identify myself as somebody who goes out and makes videos, makes content, makes music. So... Yeah, YouTuber, yeah, uh, artist. I mean, I, I've always considered an entrepreneur someone that runs their own business too, but mm. yeah, running the same business for an extended period of time. And if, you, if you're more focused on what you are making, then like, how's the business going to make more money? How are we going to like maximize profits and things like that? Then yeah, labeling yourself more as like the tangible skill that you do, which is, you know, week in, week out, you're making you're making videos, you're making courses, you're making podcasts and content for people to to get better, to like, how, how, yeah. how have you gone through like College Info Geek, I wanna help college students and then progress into kind of, everyone can get benefit from like the content you make. Yeah, the way that I describe it now is I try to help people become more capable and I like that as a sort of catch-all term because if I think about it, really in terms of the content I've made through College Info Geek, it has really kind of just fell under that umbrella. Um, I've done a lot of academic stuff, but especially when I was in college, a lot of the content I was making was just simply about how to become more capable, whether it be 
how to, uh, you know, get more consistent with your habits or, you know, how to be stronger or how to study more effectively or make connections. It was just kind of the things I found interesting in terms of self-improvement. So now that I am no longer a college student and haven't been for, boy, like eight or nine years, um, it doesn't make sense for me to kind of brand myself under a, a college moniker. Uh, so I, I just, just you, slowly started shifting away from college info geek and being more me. So did you, I mean, you still have the brand college info geek and yes. the website is still titled that, correct? Like the URL yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, have you thought about just like dropping it and just making it Thomas Frank or like coming up with a new name or is like, what has kept you from doing that? Instead of dropping College Info Geek, I personally am just sort of uh, diverging away from it while still having a hand in running it. So these days, my head writer, Ransom, is the person who writes nearly every new article on College Info Geek. And if he doesn't write an article, then he is going out and finding subject matter experts to write articles. So um, our friend Shirag Shamassian does articles sometimes about medical school admissions, things like that. I'm hoping to either interview my friend Devin or have him write an article about law school, things like that. Uh, whereas I am just working on making videos. Uh, our podcast is going to end in June, so we will no longer have the College Info Geek podcast. We're going to start a new podcast. Mm -hmm. So I will just kind of be the owner of College Info Geek, but I won't have a whole lot of say in the day-to-day -day running of it going forward. And do you feel like that's because you – you've like covered everything or like you said what you wanted to say. You said you've been out of school for eight or nine years now. So you're not like as in touch with that, but also it's just like that resource is at like 95 to a hundred percent of what you need to help people with. And so you're ready to like move on from it. I, well, I actually think that resource is not even close to meeting its full potential, but mm -hmm. it is no longer my core interest to write about uh, you know, updating FAFSA guidelines for federal student aid or talking about, you know, admissions or talking about even studying for tests anymore. You know, I I guess I technically do have to study for a Part 107 drone test in the future. So, you know, I, I may make some content around that. But what I'm more interested now is in, uh, you know, just your general self-improvement kind of stuff. And I don't think that that necessarily needs to exist under college branding but at the same time college info geek has a lot more to give to the world so i'm going to continue to keep it up keep it running uh keep paying people to run it but other people will be basically producing the content for it do you have to kind of silo like finances or employees or things like that now that you they're kind of separate businesses at this point where you have college info geek it's doing its thing it makes money in its own ways and then the YouTube channel makes money. Are you using, like, is everything just kind of combined and you're using YouTube money to fund College Info Geek and it's just kind of a mess? Yeah. Um, I, I don't think it's so much to the point where YouTube subsidizes College Info Geek, but it gets close. Like, College Info mm -hmm. Geek has, you know, uh, one person working on it as their entire thing. And then uh, Martin, who works with me as almost a partner, he spends a decent amount of his time and hence the budget that goes to his, uh, what I pay him, uh, going towards College Info Geek as well. So it's possible that YouTube subsidizes it sometimes, um, but I don't try to break it down too much. And I'm not one of those hard-nosed businessmen who is just like, the, the website didn't make enough money this month, so I have to slash this person's pay. Like, we're yeah, a very yeah. holistic business, and as long as everyone's working to contribute something and you know, helping to make these resources more helpful, then as long as we're bringing in money and the trajectory is overall going in the right direction, then I'm happy with it. Um, and, you know, I, I don't necessarily think only in terms of profit for each arm of the business. Like I said, I think College Info Geek is a resource that benefits the world. And if it does so in a way that doesn't directly generate money, I'm kind of okay with that because I think there are things out there that need to be communicated to students and hopefully can be done so for free um, that necessarily don't lead you know, super easily to something that I can charge for without adding a whole lot of extra work to my plate. Because, I mean, going, going back six, seven years to when we kind of got to know each other through Fizzle and the Fizzle forums and you working on College Info Geek and, you know, like, you want to choose a market that, like, has a lot of needs and has a lot of money. And it's like, college kids are not people that have a lot of money. So like building a business, like helping college kids, I mean, you've, you've done it over the years and you've found ways to make money through it, but 
that's that's tough. You all, you also like feel bad like these people are going into tens of thousands of dollars in debt to get an mm-hmm. education, and then you want to convince them to buy like your five hundred dollar course on how to like get more scholarships or something. You know, it's just it, it's yeah. kind of a tough mental thing. Have you struggled with that at all as as you were growing that business? Oh, I've struggled with it for my entire career, and uh, so I never ended up making a course that I host for myself. Um, but I, I always wanted to, and I would go back and forth between you know the people who would tell me you need to charge what you're worth, and you're giving away 99% of your content for free, so it's okay if you have something expensive. And then the other side that's like, no, these these people don't have a whole lot of money to spend. And there's there's persuasive arguments on all sides. I'll have people who are like, you know, these people, these college students, they can afford these thousands and thousands of dollars for college courses. Why can't they afford just another 500 for your course? Uh, But the way that I think about it now um, is if I'm building a business around myself and like it or not building a business around myself as an influencer, then to sell a very high priced course and justify the presence of my free content uh, it seems a little disingenuous because I think the free content and the free content's effect at building me up into an influential figure can would cause people to um, maybe make justifications for why they should spend a bunch of money on a paid product that aren't necessarily grounded in reality. So for me, and this is just my own personal like ethical standpoint on this, I don't want to judge anybody else, I want to make things as either free or you know, accessible as they can be, which is why I chose to go with Skillshare for the courses I did eventually build because it's like, what, 10 bucks a month and then Mm -hmm. there's a trial. So people could technically take my courses for free and then cancel if they wanted to. And uh, fortunately enough, we've been able to make enough money off of that that it's worthwhile to keep doing it, but I can still sleep at night with, you know, my own ethical quandaries about this. If you're willing to share the the business part of that Skillshare course, this was one that you went to their offices and you filmed it there, right? It wasn't like a self-produced yeah. thing. So I'm assuming there was some sort of upfront that you got paid as well as the residual mm-hmm. of you're bringing people to the platform through signups and people that watch your course. That's how you get paid through it as well. So my course is a Skillshare original and uh, original, people okay. who are kind of unfamiliar with Skillshare, anybody can sign up, anybody can make a course. Um, and there are, there's just you know, your normal everyday courses, and then there are normal courses that become staff picks. So those are courses that are still produced by anybody. It's just that they have a really high level of quality or they're made by somebody influential or who's a, you know, a subject matter expert and recognized in their field. So Skillshare will put the staff pick badge on their course. And then there are uh, originals, which are produced in collaboration with the content team at Skillshare. So when I decided I wanted to go with Skillshare to make my course, and uh, to reiterate, my reasoning was, number one, it's very accessible for people who want to take it because of the affordability of the platform. But number two, I've been working with Skillshare as a sponsor on my YouTube channel and on my podcast for a couple of years at that point. So from a business perspective, I'm like, if nothing else, the presence of my own courses on the platform should improve conversions on my sponsorship reads because people are going to want to they're going to want to see what I made. So that should hopefully be able to increase what I charge Skillshare for sponsorships. Um, that being said, there was no upfront payment for the course uh, other than I think there was like a $700 travel stipend they gave me for getting mm-hmm. to New York and paying for the hotel. So it's but your job to drive traffic to these courses to to earn what you it's want. It's mostly my job. Uh, there was a big benefit. Other people will find them it. organically too. But. Yeah, well, so there's a big benefit to doing it as an original because since it was an original, Skillshare put some of their own marketing weight into it. They sent like a big email blast at the beginning of the year. They had a banner on the kind of logged in homepage for I think like five days. So they did a little bit more than I think they usually would to help to drive people to the class. And then the way you make money on Skillshare, uh, you know, barring any kind of upfront paid sponsorship on YouTube or podcasts is twofold. There is the affiliate program where if you drive people to sign up through your affiliate link, you get $10 per sign up. And then there's the watch time. Um, And I think it roughly averages out to like four and a half to five and a half cents per minute of premium watch time. So I didn't know how much watch time I was going to get. So going into this, I was like, maybe I can increase my rates on prepaid ads and then maybe I can use my email list, my website as a way to drive affiliate signups. And I think that's how I'm going to make 
the majority of my money in here, and then the and watch time the watch is probably time just going to be just going to be bonus. Yeah. I thought it was going to be beer money. Um, <laughs> turns out the watch time is actually the majority of the income. Oh, interesting. Okay, by far. But that's good. That means <laughs> that means that people that find it organically or through their promotions or through your affiliate link, they're actually going through your course. Which mm -hmm. I've I've done a lot of filming of online courses. I've watched a lot of online courses. I have my own courses, and you always wonder like who's going to make it through like who's going to watch the whole course so the fact that you're earning a lot from watch time means that like your course is engaging and it mm -hmm. is interesting to people and holding their attention and so when you worked on that course how long is it i think it's pretty short right it's an hour well, or two. i have two of them now and they're both about okay. an hour each okay so they're very highly condensed mm -hmm. as opposed to like when you maybe would try to sell it on your own for 500 or 200 or 3,000, whatever, you might try to like jam it with hours and hours of content so people are like feel like they get their yeah. worth. Did, did you feel like we want to make this as succinct and as as tight as possible when you were making it? Yeah. So what I've been told by Skillshare is uh, classes tend to do best when they're between like 45 minutes and 90 minutes. Any more than 90 minutes is... I think it may be something inherent to the platform or it could be something that is uh, inherent to all online courses and they just have better analytics, people tend to start dropping off. So it might be better on Skillshare specifically to split, say, a three-hour course into two courses. Maybe like, you know, if you're doing like Premiere Pro, like beginner Premiere Pro and then advanced mm -hmm. Premiere Pro instead of just like the ultimate Premiere Pro. Yeah, and, I mean, my, uh, strategy with, my strategy with courses is like I have this like one how to like film everything course. And mm -hmm. then I have one on Premiere and one on Final Cut. And that's all I've had for a while. But our strategy going into this year is like, what if we did 12 courses, like average one a month, and they were really small, like mm. better lighting, better audio, like yeah, film with your phone or, you know, like camera settings. Like, and, and as like a buyer, it's like, okay, I can buy that thing for $29 or something. And help solve this problem this weekend as opposed to like, do I want to make this big investment and hours and hours of learning involved? And I think that obviously I'm at the beginning of making those and launching them and things like that. But I'm curious to see what the response will be from the student perspective and the completion perspective in the back end of Teachable when I'm like seeing how many videos people watch. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can tell you as a buyer myself, I would rather buy a small course about one thing and then, you know, just kind of like a la carte shop. Uh, in fact, my, my editor and I now do intense learning days. So we'll just say like this day, we are going to learn how to do a cinematic lighting setup, for example, or one that we have coming up eventually is we're going to take an entire day to learn as much about DaVinci Resolve as we can. And I find that more compelling than I have acquired the ultimate course about everything I ever need to know because that, that's just not how I tend to learn. I'm not the kind of person who wants to like front load all the reading and book learning and then try to do it all. I would much rather just read about one element and then go try to do it. Yeah, I feel like I'm doing that with with weightlifting where instead of sitting and like reading a whole weightlifting book, um, I'm reading Starting Strength and mm -hmm. like read all of that before I like ever go to the gym versus like I'm reading the squat section and I'll read like, I don't know, five pages and then I'll like highlight three or four things to think about the next time I go into the gym and I'm doing squats. So it's like, yeah, you're doing the thing while you're learning the thing slowly, as opposed to like, no, I need to cram like all this information and then go try to do it. It, it doesn't, you don't retain it first of all, and then mm -hmm. you delayed the process of like learning while while you're doing it. So I, I don't know. Yeah. That's what that's what I'm doing. I don't know. You you're really into weightlifting. What are some resources? This is. This podcast goes wherever I want it to. So, uh, <laughs> what are some resources for you that you've learned about weightlifting, or is it just been mainly? Well, doing for me coaching? specifically, I mean, for me specifically, it was a. Uh, I learned a lot from my dad because uh, growing up, he kind of just like forced us to work out and weightlift. Uh, and then I got into college, and I really kind of upped my dedication in college for a while. And starting strength was definitely one of them. Um, I didn't read the book. It was. I kind of just trawled through the bodybuilding.com forums and just picked up a lot of stuff by osmosis and by talking to people. Mm -hmm. But I definitely was following that Ripito 5x5 starting strength program for a long time. And then, uh, you know, I always direct people to Nerd Fitness. I think Nerd Fitness is like probably the best like starting resource for anybody who wants to get into fitness. And then from there, there are a zillion different directions you can go 
but I think Steve has done a really good job at making it very accessible and also exciting and fun. And so that's where I always direct people. Perfect. I want to talk a bit about what it's like to be like a full-time or a pro YouTuber, someone that Mm -hmm. doesn't just do YouTube for fun or they're not just doing YouTube to drive traffic to somewhere else, but like you've, you've put out consistent videos for years, grown a very strong audience and you have this semi predictability of when I hit publish on a video, I know it will get hundreds of thousands of views mm-hmm. unless it's like so out there. So th- there are a lot of things I want to dive into. One is, was there like a moment where you're like, oh, I like, this is my thing now? Like <laughs> I when, think maybe when you was. signed on to it, the ad company, was that kind of the moment or was no, it some it was- other time? It was before that, and I don't feel like I've ever thought of myself like as purely a YouTuber. Uh, and and now, you know, I, I do wake up every morning, and I'm like, all right, what I do is YouTube videos and a little bit of podcasting. I'm no longer a blogger. Um, you know, that just kind of grew very, very slowly over time. But I remember I started YouTube, and I started YouTube viewing YouTube as a hosting service. In fact, I had a a very long internal debate about whether to use YouTube or Wistia. Because I think uh, Fizzle was using Wistia at the time. And I, th- I feel like there was this big disconnect between the, the pro blogging world and the YouTube world where people in the blogging world didn't really look at YouTube as a potential way to get traffic. Um, even though you know they knew that people had gotten big on YouTube, I think like most people in the blogging world didn't really see that as viable for them. So they were like, oh, they were all like, these You don't want people analytics. to leave your website. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You, don't want to, you don't want people going off platform which is crazy because I feel like the internet is now just coalescing into you know a few different content delivery platforms and indie websites are having more and more trouble uh, competing with that. But you know back then, people in the blogging world were like, yeah, you know, Wistia would probably be better because there's analytics and you can like have an email sign-up thing go on screen at the end. Uh, and my reason for not using Wistia at first was I just didn't want to pay for it. It was really expensive. Yeah. So I'm like, I'll just go on YouTube. And uh, my channel had 90 subscribers. I had had my channel since 2006, made stupid videos with my brother. So I had 90 subscribers, probably a bunch of high school friends. And uh, I didn't want to give up those subscribers, so I kept it on that channel instead of making (laughs) a college boogie channel. so funny now that you have... uh, What's the URL on it? Something I? Uh, It's YouTube.com. Oh, so the the URL people can go to is YouTube.com slash Thomas Frank. But the real one is slash electric I 91 and then electric so has a some, K at the end. So like my name high, from school. high school or college. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you didn't want to lose 90 subscribers, which didn't is in lose the 90 subscribers. Of now is, is funny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you have those old videos still public? Like, do, are you one of the YouTubers that has every video, no. like all the way back now? You, you no, hit, so you I, hit them once you like committed to it. Uh, no, I had them up for a very long time. And then there, there came a point at some point, I don't remember when, when I went back and, uh, unlisted or privated a lot of them. I think mm-hmm. like, like some of them, like I had used music that had not been claimed, but I'm like, you didn't uh, want to get your channel flagged th- at that point. Yeah. I was like, well, this song is like a, you know, it's a creative Commons song, but it's actually based off of a video game song. And there's tons of video game YouTubers who use video game music, but like maybe someday in the future, Nintendo's going to start cracking down or I don't know. So there, there were like justifications like that. Um, but so I started and I was like, these are, little additions to my blog posts and I just happened to be hosting them on YouTube. And then so you were as writing, I making, you're full on writing content and then you're making like a video version of it. Sometimes doing that. Sometimes just yeah. making a video and you know, my, my original inspiration was actually Chase took uh, a snippet from his productivity course inside of Fizzle and made it a blog post. I think it was like called CEO mode versus worker B mode. That was like, I was like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to make a video. I'm going to put it on a blog post. It's like the featured image. And then I'm, maybe I'll type up a you know summary of it or something. And then as I started making videos, I started finding YouTubers that I really, really liked. And I was just binging their channels. And I'm like, this is really fun. I'm going to actually do this. Uh, so <laughs> you know, I just, I just kept doing it and doing it. And then I think it was my eighth video went viral on Reddit. And that was the moment where I thought, okay, I'm a YouTuber now. Not just somebody who makes videos for blog posts. So what was it about that eighth video? What was the kind of title and thumbnail and did it just get shared to the specific subreddit that helped it kind of take off and the algorithm picked it up or what was it about that, do you think? I think so. So the video is called 
I don't feel like it is a mindset for amateurs. And it's just a, a really quick video I threw together about the whole concept that, you know, not feeling like you want to do work doesn't actually physically prevent you from still doing the work. And um, professionals are people who work past the feeling of, I don't feel like it, and they still do the work anyway. And, uh, you know, it all kind of stemmed from that. I think it was like a Stephen Pressfield quote or something about how uh, professionals get inspired, just like amateurs. It just so happens that they get inspired every day at 8 a.m., or whenever it is they decided to put themselves on a schedule and work. And the funny thing is that video was made because I was working on a bigger video and I didn't have time to finish the bigger video for my deadline because uh, I was on a very strict deadline per week back then. So I just threw that video together in probably three hours. <laughs> and I think it just, it just struck a chord. And then somebody posted it, I want to say, to the Get Motivated subreddit. And that's kind of where it took off. When you say it went viral, like what are, what numbers are we talking about and what numbers were your other videos getting? My other videos were getting like, you know, lucky if I got a thousand views in a month, like, you know, pretty small. And then this video went up to 40,000 views in a day. And then I think the algorithm kicked it up to about 70,000 in a week. And that's where it started to taper off. So, you know, not like super ultra viral, but for my channel, you know, a huge smash success and something I had never expected to happen. And then it took my subscribers and this was cool. Cause I, I had these like notebook sheets where I would make goals of what, like I wanted to hit 500 subscribers by this month. So I think I was at 230 ish subscribers and working my way up to my 500 goal. And then overnight it was at 2000. So did that just kind of like re-energize you towards YouTube? So it wasn't like you made this one video it got 70,000 views, you got tons of money. You know, like, did you even have ads on at that point? Like, or, or was it just no. like a mental thing of like, oh, this this is resonating with people. I'm gonna like commit to YouTube now. Yeah, it was more that. It was more, hey, this, this actually made an impact. And also, you know, I'm watching all these channels that I really love to watch. Um, Cat Icarus was a big one for me back then. Uh, John Tron, another one. I just loved these video game YouTubers that would do all these crazy animations and have fun editing tricks. So I wanted to do that. I was having more fun doing that than blogging. And then that video was like validation. Oh, you can, you can build something out of this. And at the time, I, again, coming from the blogging world, I thought very much in terms of funnels. So I thought if I have AdSense in my videos, that's actually going to decrease the number of people who finish my video. And that's gonna decrease the number of people who join my email list and eventually you know, make their way to my website and to the articles that I've monetized. So I actually didn't monetize my channel until I had more than 100,000 subscribers. And I remember even you convinced me to turn on ads on mine because I was very like mm. anti-advertising. Um, like I just want people to like, get into the content, like yeah, get them into the funnel or whatever. They can, I want them to click affiliate links, I want them to buy my courses or get on my email list, what have you. Mm -hmm. But I think you said something like, people don't view the ads they see on YouTube as like a decision the creator made. It's just like, this is the cost time-wise of like watching videos on YouTube. Like they view the, yep. the platform as the thing that's showing the ads. Yeah, and that's what Sean Davis told me uh, when I was visiting him in San Diego, I think it was in 2016. And yeah, he was the exact same thing. You know, people don't view the ad as something you put there. They view it as something YouTube put there. So. Don't think that people are going to think badly of you and uh, you're throwing away money, dude. <laughs> so I turned AdSense on after that day and I'm glad that I did because, you know, that yeah. that's a substantial amount of money every month that comes in. I don't, you know, that I mean, the, the actual amount fluctuates from month to month, but I think it ends up being like 15% of our income as a business is AdSense. So it's not nothing. And when you have sponsors on your videos, you also have AdSense on them, correct? That's like part um, of the standard YouTube. When I have like a sponsor, contract? which is yeah. every video now, I turn the ads off for 30 days. 30 days, okay. And the reason we do that, this is something that my my particular agency has as a rule. It's uh, probably not universal across all of influencer marketing, but my agency has dug into the data and they noticed that um, you know, there's, there's a myriad of reasons why a spot may not perform well for a sponsor, but one one variable that was consistent was that the spots that didn't do well almost always had AdSense on. 
the spots that did really, really well almost always had AdSense off. Hmm. So the theory is that um, people kind of, maybe they won't pay attention to the sponsor as much if there's AdSense, or maybe the, the AdSense ad is competing with the sponsor, or maybe people think this person is putting so many ads in their videos and they don't convert to the sponsor because of a, a grudge, I guess. I don't know. But uh, for that reason, we turned it off. Did you have sponsors on your videos before you actually worked with a, a company, like a, a, a network or whatever? Like, did you go one-to-one -one with with brands to have sponsors before you were part of a, a larger like network of YouTube channels? Uh, only with Skillshare. So they reached out directly to me, and I worked on two spots with them uh, personally, negotiated the contracts myself, and I think those were six months apart. And then I did a couple with Audible that were through an agency, just not the agency I use now. Uh, and again, those were like each, I think probably six months apart. So my conception of working with sponsorships was they're flash in the pan things that happen every once in a while and I shouldn't rely on them. And then I signed with Standard and uh, now that I'm with Standard, every video is sponsored. And you know, it's to the point where like, companies will reach out being like, hey, how do we get on your show? And we're like, we don't have enough spots. So it's totally flipped and it's yeah. kind of crazy. I feel like early YouTube, it was like, if you get signed by an MCN, a multi-channel network, you like have made it. And then it went through this mm. phase of like, do not sign with an MCN. MCNs are bad. Yeah. Like they're going to take advantage of you. Um, what What are the advantages of being a part of Standard? And maybe explain what it is. Yeah, so Standard is not your typical YouTuber agency. Um, so yeah, I guess let me like give everyone a lay of the land now. From my vantage point, it seems like the MCN model has sort of gone the way of the dinosaur. Maybe there's some still around. I don't know. I certainly don't get MCN pitches anymore. Um, and the MCN model was they would literally become like part owner in your channel and they would get your AdSense revenue and then give you a cut of it and keep a cut of it for themselves. And then, you know, in exchange for that, they would ostensibly help you get higher AdSense rates. They would maybe help you get sponsors, all this kind of stuff. And in many cases, it was vague and the promises were not held up. Uh, now, it seems like that's not so big of a thing. It's more influencer marketing agencies that get you brand deals for a commission percentage. For a percentage um, yeah. Standard is even different than that because that's only one thing they do. So you do sign on as a creator. The main thing they do is get you is get you sponsors. But Standard is also building a new streaming platform called Nebula that we're all on. So everyone in Standard is on Nebula. And then there's, um, I don't know if it's totally public yet, but there's you know eventually going to be the ability to apply to be on Nebula even if you're not a Standard creator. And I think that you know the the standards are still pretty high, but it may not you know it may be a case where you could get into Nebula even if you couldn't get into Standard for whatever reason, or if you were already with another agency. Um, they also run our merch. We have a big Slack group where we're always communicating. And from what I've How learned about other agencies, is it at this point, uh, it's 50, probably like right? around eighty, I would say. Okay. Um, and they're so yeah, like mainly a lot of us in, like in the Slack the together. Science education. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of education. Niche, but there's some other ones too. Yeah. 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 There's there's a few other ones like uh, like Boy in a Band. You know, he's kind of like a musician sometimes. Sometimes education, but I would say you know it, it kind of coalesces around education channels. Um, so it, it kind of operates differently and more expansively than a typical agency. But for agency purposes, Standard takes 20% of any sponsorship deals that I get, but they're the ones who go and get them for me. And they negotiate it. They negotiate the rates. They deal with any and all hassles. So I don't have to worry about it. They worry about it. And for that reason, I am more than happy to give them 20% because I know personally, I would I would never book that many spots myself. You know, and you'd have to pay somebody to negotiations. manage all that at this mm -hmm. point too. You know, you'd have to hire somebody to be doing all that, and that twenty percent would go to them. But yeah. you might also not have the the connections and the network. And and mm -hmm. I mean, when you go to VidCon and stuff like that, you, you get to hang out with the other YouTubers that are part of Standard, and you get to those become yes. your peers too. So I don't really know of another group like standard like you said it's kind of swung to the everyone is their own independent thing because they want to keep the money or they're to a level where they don't need the help to like get the brands that they want but sounds well, like I a, think, a really good group to be a part of 
I mean, there are a lot of other agencies out there. There's like, I mean, there's a ton of them. Um, I just don't mm-hmm. know of any that operate in quite the same way as standard. I haven't heard of another one that encourages as much creator communication as standard. Like a lot of the people who work with agencies, like they don't even know a full listing of who of all the other people in the agency. And there certainly isn't like a super active Slack group. Uh, yeah. And I guess like, I do want to put a few things out there for anybody who's listening to this as a creator who may be getting to the point in their career where they're working with sponsors. There's a lot of pitfalls that you could fall into. And I did for a while. So a few pointers that I would give out here. Uh, number one, if you're going to work with an agency, they should be disclosing what their commission take is because some agencies don't disclose that. Uh, which, you know, being me, like naive me a few years ago, didn't even think about that. I was just like, oh, they're offering me this amount of money. Cool. I guess that's what Audible's paying me. But no, Audible was paying them a certain amount of money and then they were giving me a percentage of it. And uh, in the, the case of the first agency I worked with, they didn't disclose what that percentage was. Um, they, uh, Some agencies will also try to lock you in. So they'll say things like, oh, you can't work with this sponsor for six months or a year after the last time you worked with them through us, through anyone else. Uh, standard doesn't do that. There's like a 30 day, you can just say it's like, I'm going to walk away in 30 days. You're just done. And there's no restrictions, which is, you know, I think that's the right thing to do. Um, the other thing, and this is, this is kind of getting back to how MCNs operated. So if you're a creator and you have an agency come to you and they're like, all right, this brand wants to pay this much, but they want to guarantee on this many views for that money. You might think that that is reasonable, but When you think about business, right, and you think about advertising performance, views are not the single determining variable for the performance of an ad. Because like just for a very simple example, take a channel like, let's just say like Real Men Real Style that talks about men's fashion. And then let's take a channel like Emergency Awesome, which is doing, I don't know, recap of The Witcher episode eight or something like that. If both of these channels run an ad for Indochino suits, 100,000 views on Real Men Real Style is going to convert so much better for suits than 100,000 views on a Witcher recap episode. Because if you know Ant- Antonio makes a video on how to tie a tie, then he's getting 100,000 people who are interested in how to tie a tie, therefore primed to buy a suit. And his channel is much more influential for that product versus like, you know, random people just wanting to get some, you know, hot tips on what happened in The Witcher, they're not primed. So a much smaller percentage of those 100,000 views are going to convert for suits. So when an agency comes to you and says, we want a view guarantee for for this much, uh, it, it strikes me as a little bit disingenuous because they're not at least sharing with you the factors that actually go into your conversions. They're just saying, get these amount of views. And I don't know how this works. You know, I don't know how this actually works, but the way I've always thought about MCNs is what's their incentive? So if you think about the incentives of an agency, like you think about their goal, their goal is to make more money. And they can do that by putting lots of painstaking effort into nurturing the creator relationships they already have, which in all fairness, they may do, but they can also do it by getting more creators. And let's be real, that's easier especially if you have some big, like, you know, big famous creators on your roster that you can use as sort of a draw to bring in more creators. So, you know, you say you bring in some creators who get fewer views on a video, so they're not as big and influential in terms of like, you know, influence or status, but they're talking about niche topics. You know, you get a video or a a creator that does like 5,000 views per video, but it's on like men's cologne. That's probably pretty influential because that's a really niche market much, much more influential than 5,000 views on The Witcher or some TV show. Yeah, so So as a creator, use that as a a bargaining chip when you're talking with sponsors or or agencies mm -hmm. to be like, okay, maybe my view count's not as big, but this is a hyper-targeted audience. And so if we have a sponsor that can relate to that a little better, not just something like out of left field, but something that's related to it, conversions should be good. Are, Are you judged? based on how your conversions do or yeah yeah i mean sometimes absolutely um i am not judged on views at all in fact uh some of my sponsors will send me periodic reports on how my spots have done and um you know, in, in other sponsors, it's like, uh, you know, it's like a, it's a bit.ly link. So I can actually see how many clicks there were. 
and I'll be like, oh, hey, this, these two videos I did, did around the same amount of views, but this one did so many more clicks or, or they'll email me like this video did really, really well. This video didn't convert well at all, which is weird because there were a lot of views on it. So I'll dig in and I'll be like, okay, hmm, well, this video was on resume tips and I transitioned into the Skillshare read by saying, hey, if you want to become more, more, uh, competitive in your career field, you may want to branch out and learn some personal branding skills. Here's a course there. You may want to improve your actual hard skills. Like say you're a video editor, here's a video editing course that added really well. And then I do another video that's like, you know, test taking tips, same amount of views, but it's about tests. So the audience is not quite as primed to be sold on like business training or something like that. You know, so The only reason I bring this up is because, you know, I don't want people getting taken advantage of. So if an agency comes to you and they're like, hey, we want a view guarantee, your response shouldn't be sure thing. Let me get you that those number of views. Your response should be, why do you need a view guarantee? Why shouldn't we be tracking, you know, uh, clicks over to the sponsor or cost per acquisition, which should really be the gold standard in uh, Mm -hmm. your performance, at least for a conversion focused company. If you're working for a bigger brand like Coca-Cola or something like that, maybe they're looking for views but not every company is looking for a big mindshare play. They're not buying billboards. They're actually, you know, asking, you know, how much marketing spend do we have to, uh, you know, do to acquire a customer? And views are just one tiny variable in that equation. Speaking of views, how do you choose what to make on YouTube now? Do you, do you choose based on what you think will be popular? Do you choose based on what you want to make at this point? Because with millions of subscribers and knowing that no matter what you put out, it'll get a decent amount of views, like a a large amount of views that you weren't getting when you started. Do you get caught up in the numbers still? And do you, does that influence what you make? Yeah. I mean, I definitely get caught up in the numbers. I I would love to say that I don't, but it's, it would be a lie. (laughs) Um, I, I think that my topic selection is, a, a careful dance and it, it balances all the elements. Um, I'm thinking about what will do well. I'm thinking about what I actually want to make and I'm thinking about what's going to be truly helpful to the audience. Um, and you know, I try not to go too far in any one of those directions. If I were to make exactly what I want to make, then the, we'd have some weird videos sometimes <laughs> and they <laughs> wouldn't do well. Um, and that's kind of the nice thing about Nebula is like I can do a Nebula original where I could sometimes even get funding for it, but it's on something you, that you probably just did wouldn't one do well. Right I just before, did one. I did it on Gravity one. Falls. Yeah. You know, yeah. Disney TV show, one of my favorites of all time, but I couldn't put that on my YouTube channel. It would tank. Um, and the problem is the algorithm takes your previous video's performance into consideration when it is going to decide how much to promote your, your next videos. So, you know, doing too many videos that tank in a row can actually really hurt you in the future. Um, and that, that is also why you have your podcast on a separate channel, correct? Yes. Yeah. And you know, it, I don't think it's a total like, uh, you know, like surefire thing. And maybe my podcast would actually do better on my own channel. Like you can look at Linus tech tips as a great example here. They have the WAN show on their channel, you know, does well in terms of a podcast, but it doesn't do nearly as many views as their normal videos. And it doesn't seem to hurt their normal videos. Or if it does, it doesn't hurt them in uh, you know, a, a meaningful way. Like they're still willing and it's to a, a quantity to do thing that. too of how many they put out a week. That's true. It's like, you know seven videos yeah. per week. The WAN show just yeah. is one of them. So, and you know you don't have to be too afraid. Like you can branch out a little bit. I've had videos totally bomb, and the next one does amazing. Case in point, I did a video on why it's so hard to remember people's names. I thought that video would just kill because everyone has trouble remembering names. That video bombed so hard. I was watching like the the analytics the first few days and I'm just like, man, no one is watching this. And I was so depressed because again, the numbers get to me and I wish they didn't. And then the, the next video I released is the one hour morning routine. And that's like my most successful video in three or four months. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's not entirely dependent on past performance, but what I've been told is, you know, a trend line of bad performance on a channel can really hurt the potential of a new video. So that is why it's not always feasible to branch out and do exactly what you want. But on the other hand, I can't do specifically what I know would be popular because I, to do trendy content just sucks the life out of me. I can't do it. Mm. You know, like, oh, you know, I mean, here's a great example. 
um, Charlie over at Charisma on Command is very good at tapping into the current trends and doing videos on that. So he'll do like, you know, The Witcher was popular. So his latest video is on The Witcher. I personally just can't do that because number one, I'm not really interested in what's popular in popular culture right now. Like I just finished The Witcher, whereas everyone else watched it like, I don't know, a month or two ago. I watched Game of Thrones like five years too late. I'm just the kind of person who's interested in weird stuff or playing music. So I don't want to kind of like obligate myself to go be interested in what's super popular right now just so I can make content on it. And I want to dive into the the, the algorithm part because I, I still am at the point with my channel where I, I kind of don't care about the algorithm or I try not to care. Like sometimes mm-hmm. I know if I publish this video or I'm like, publishing this podcast on my main channel that like most of the people that subscribe were because I did like a camera review. They might not care about how to grow a YouTube channel or the things we're talking about, but I'm like in this, I don't care situation. So do you think it's like a tipping point of like you reach a certain point or YouTube is more of like your salary and you're working with sponsors and you need like to know that the video is going to do well, where it like starts to matter what the algorithm is versus just like kind of doing what you want. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be unique to every person. Some people might get really into the data early on, but it's definitely the case that if you start working with sponsors and they represent a large chunk of your income, or if AdSense represents a large chunk of your income, then you're going to care about the algorithm and how it affects every video a lot more than if you're somebody like Gary Vaynerchuk, or even if you're somebody like Pat Flynn, where The majority of the income is coming from course sales. So it's not so much that every individual video needs to perform super well, but that, you know, the channel overall should be growing because it as an entire entity represents a funnel that brings people into the actual income generating things. But yeah, with with sponsors, you know, you're you're kind of worried with every video. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's kind of been my philosophy is like the digital side of my business compared to client and now SwitchPod brings in less than 10% of my income. Mm -hmm. And, and it also does that with like very little activity, like going months without publishing things. So it's like, if if I'm just publishing more, like that's gotta be better than not publishing because I'm afraid of what the algorithm is going to do. I'd rather just like make things that I want to make and have conversations with people and publish them Mm -hmm. as opposed to just nothing. (laughs) Like, like it's gotta be better algorithmically that at least published than the channel's just silent. Like I think I think that people get afraid of of publishing and sharing. Like yeah, I don't want to like post on Instagram, I'll lose followers. And it's like, but like then just you're just never gonna post because you don't want to lose followers. Like, what's the point? Yeah, the way I think about it is like, all right, so you have a hundred thousand followers on Instagram, but you're afraid to post. Like though if if those people are gonna leave because you posted, then they're not really followers. They just have forgotten to click the unfollow button so far. You know, so don't even count them. In, if, if you can't post, if you can't express yourself, or if you can't use content to grow your business, then those numbers don't do anything for you other than, I don't know, maybe get you an inflated book deal someday, you know, but that's a, that's a pretty uh, rare thing. And yeah, yeah, I'm sure book publishers are also digging into engagement with things like that. They're not just like, oh, hey, he bought 50,000 followers. Let's give him a six-figure deal, you know. Yeah. And I mean, um, one thing I'll say with, with regards to your question about balancing what's going to you know, resonate with the audience versus what I want to make, uh, where I've really been leaning into what I want to make is in the frequency of my content because I'm very aware and I have, you know, experience with this. I'm very aware that I can make four videos a month and make a pretty substantial amount of money from that amount of frequency. But the kind of content that I can produce in that amount of time doing four videos a month is no longer to the standards that I want to hit. Um, I want to make better stuff. I want to make more dynamic videos. I want to do actual sound design. I want to go out and get shots in places that aren't just in my studio. And to do that, I can't make a video per week. So uh, this year, actually, I have cut way down on the number of spots I'm doing per month. And I've accepted that it it is going to bring, at least in the short term, a loss of money. But that's okay. And is is the the bet or the gamble that a you, you're gonna enjoy it more and be more creatively fulfilled because you're going to be expanding in that way and how you make them and what they become, but also maybe the audience will grow as a part of that, and then you can yeah. make 
half as many videos, but they'll get twice as many views because the audience will start to grow. They're like get shared more because they're they are more engaging or they are more produced. Yeah, I mean, regardless of what happens with the views, um, you know, last year was by far our biggest year ever in terms of revenue. And it was also by far the biggest year in terms of anxiety, near depression, uh, stress, like chronic stress on my part and burnout. And I, you know, again, regardless of the views, I would trade, uh, I would trade half of that money <laughs> for not being constantly stressed stress. out. Yeah. Not, uh, you know, a big one, not, not putting my relationship with my uh, fiance on hold essentially like hey i gotta work until midnight tonight sorry deadlines i'll hang out with you next week mm -hmm. like it's not worth the extra money um but you know from a business perspective yeah i absolutely believe that more time put into videos will increase the amount of engagement the amount of views the growth of the channel i mean and in in my area all you need to do is look to people like matt diavella like joey from better ideas like nathaniel drew as examples of people who are putting more time more production value into their content and reaping very real rewards in terms of audience growth from it. So, you know, in, in a way, I think, uh, you know, I really appreciate that Matt kind of just like came onto the scene and, and just showed me like how like kind of low budget my own content was. Cause for a while, like there, there wasn't a whole lot of people making productivity videos um, other than myself and most of them, you know, their production value was either at my level or below it. Um, so I didn't really have somebody to kind of like show me like, oh no, that you could take it much farther if you put in the effort and the time and the work. Uh, and then Matt's just sort of making, it's like making like these Netflix documentary style videos with like sound design and better camera work and you know, all this great editing. And I'm like, dang, you know, that's what I could be doing, but mm -hmm. I can't do it once a week. You know, I don't have the, yeah. I don't have the skill or the, the team in place to do it. So I'm just cutting down for a while and uh, I'm, I'm, I feel, find myself much more fulfilled doing more higher production level work as a result. The last thing I kind of want to touch on before we wrap up is being, being like a productivity person, but also being a video creator, you have built a lot of systems around getting, getting videos made for YouTube. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Notion and the... I know that there's a whole video about that that I, people should dive into if they're curious about your process. But also, you've recently you, you've moved and you're you're in a house now, and you were setting up one room about the same size as maybe a room in a previous place, mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how to film best in there. And then you just decided to take like a, a living room sized thing and turn it into your like recording space. So I want to talk a little bit about the what what you've set up and why you set it up that way to kind of reduce the friction of making videos. Yeah, it's funny. I feel like uh, I'm in a position right now where I have vastly increased the friction of making videos because we're just, we're making better videos. Uh, but the catalyst for moving out of the room was I, I finally bought an Aperture 120D Mark II light with the big light dome. And before that, mm -hmm. I was using those like cheap limo studio lights. And uh, the light dome was very big. So yeah, I it is. got it into my studio bedroom, set it up, and I'm like, oh, this is huge. Like, I can make it yeah. work, but it's going to feel incredibly cramped in here, and I'm going to feel obligated to take it apart every time. So anyway, so I started walking around the house just looking for rooms that I could use, and I realized the basement has this media room, which we had turned into the media room, put our TV down there, but it's the biggest room in the house, so... I just moved the couch and the TV to a different area, and now this is our studio, and it's great. It's like 20 by 20. There's a storage closet, and we have a lot more room to do, you know, camera further away from me than I could have it before. We have this bigger room for tables and stuff like that. So it's just a much better space. What are the main things you've learned about having a recording set up in your house to make weekly videos? Um, was it just like you just don't change it as often. Like for a while there, you like same setup, same backdrop, camera in the same spot. Like what are some of those things that you've done to just like let the gear get out of the way? Yeah, I mean, if like if you're if you're the kind of person who wants to just get a lot of videos out, you don't want to have too much stress, then I absolutely um, advocate having an always up setup with at least the tripod and your lights and your microphone. You can just throw the camera onto the tripod. Because again, that reduces a lot of friction. And for me, a lot of the variety in my past work came in the editing. Um, 
And that's a great way to get started to build a lot of your chops. It's just that now I'm trying to mix voiceover with on-camera stuff. I'm trying to do more on-location shoots. I'm really having fun kind of mixing up the camera work specifically. So a lot of the optimizations I built with the studio setup, with Notion, I've kind of outgrown them and I have to figure out uh, you know, even more robust systems to deal with this bigger workflow. And that's the productivity person inside of you, like striving for yeah. better and, you know, it's like, what, where, where do you stop? Like, it, it's hard. Um, for, mm-hmm. for me this year, I, I've lived in this place for two years now, and I've been working on this, like, garage studio um, and, like, setting it up for what I want to be able to do and, like, having the different spaces set up and, like, my gears here and, like, okay, I can record podcasts over here and, like, the, the friction of just, like, having to move a light. It's, like, just get another light. Like, w- to me, it's just, like, what's what's the, what's the thing that's blocking me from hitting record? Get, mm-hmm. get that out of the way. And I feel like it's taken me however long to get to that point now. Yeah. And then now it's, like, I don't need to buy anything else. And so I had a video that was, like, no new gear this year for me. Like, <laughs> it's just going to be hard because, like, this is the year that Canon chooses to do, like, oh, like, a new 1DX Mark III and the C500. And, like, so it's, like a new EOS R or whatever. It's just like, I'm not going to get any of those things this year because I publicly declared it. But <laughs> like those things aren't why I'm not making videos or why my audience isn't growing or why I'm not creating the content or the courses that I want to make. Like yeah. I have enough, I have enough gear. It's a matter of like setting it up in the places that I know I can just like walk in and, and, re- and record. So mm-hmm. tell, tell me a little bit about... Um, what keeps you from making videos? Is it that like you said there was one you were like gonna make, but then you made this other idea? What still keeps you from like hitting record or starting on a video? Or is it? It's writing. It's writing. <laughs> it's yeah. It's just I need to sit my butt down, do the research, do the writing, and I I find it very easy to uh, go off and do other like procrastinate working tasks. Are you fully scripting videos still? At this point now, we're fully scripting, yeah, because I'm trying to to create videos that have a nice balance between voiceover, on-camera, stuff like that. So for the most part, I'm fully scripting. And are you teleprompting or looking down and reading it and then looking up? I just memorize my lines. or you know, And that's why VO is very easy when you're recording it because you can just read. But Right, yeah. right. Any, any other parting pieces of advice for someone that's like, they're trying to grow their YouTube channel and it's... It's, they have like some momentum, some videos do well, but some don't. Like, mm-hmm. what would you say to someone that's like trying to like break through and like really get the audience to, to grow or like to, to start working with sponsors? Um, so I've given a lot of general pieces of advice over the years. So I'm going to say one that has been on my mind very recently. And my friend Dave, who runs Standard, said this, uh, invest in plus, plus being just that extra cream on top, the extra... I don't know, you know, hidden messages in the background or, yeah, I set up the jib to get this cool moving camera movement, even though I could have just thrown it on a tripod. Do the little things that other people won't do because that's going to make your work stand out, potentially in ways that the audience won't even consciously understand, but they'll just, they'll see it as better. And if you do that, then eventually I think you're going to break through in some way or the other. Also, uh, make sure to clear off your memory card before you record a podcast. So you don't get down to like one minute Otherwise left. it gets full. Yeah, we got one minute left. We'll wrap up here. Where can go to uh, people go to find out more about your stuff online? Uh, I'm at youtube.com slash thomasfrank or thomasjfrank.com or on Instagram at tomfrankly. Perfect. And go into the archive of this podcast or other episodes with Thomas if you're curious about the earlier steps of his journey too. So thanks for joining me today, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you.